I think I need to preface this uh, by saying if you uh, have faith in government solutions, if you have faith in my president or your prime minister, uh, if you have faith in your state and federal politics, then you probably don't need to own gold. Uh, for the rest of you, uh, I'll address my, mar my remarks to you. Let's look uh, at why the gold market may do well in the future. My own bias, of course, is that in my career, 50 years in the gold trade, gold has done well when people are concerned about the maintenance uh, of the purchasing power of their savings denominated in conventional fiat savings products. Uh, and I think for the last 40 years, a, a period of declining uh, nominal and interest rates uh, and a period of really uh, amazingly balmy financial climates, that that fear uh, has been lost to people. Uh, sentiment like buy the dips, um, thoughts that you don't need to know as much about investments as you need to be in the market, uh, I think are really a product of the era between 1982 and 2022, which were, I would describe as the most favorable uh, economic and political e epoch, perhaps in human history. But I would suggest to you that that's over. Not just the obvious, uh, which is to say uh, increasing nominal and real interest rates, but the return of geopolitical concerns, even in the case of Ukraine and Russia, war. The changing of the demographics of the baby boomers coming of age over the last 40 years, uh, earning and saving as opposed to retiring and consuming, the impacts of more inclusion in the world work workplace, uh, including emerging and frontier markets people, and importantly, women. The benefits of all that are over, and I'm not suggesting that the world is going to go to hell in a handbasket. I'm just suggesting to you that people are going to have cause for more concern. The lift that the economy as an example has enjoyed and that government revenues have enjoyed from declining real interest rates is of course over. Let's look at reasons why that concern might be of more concern to you. And my apologies if this seems like an American-centric response. I'm certain that the numbers I describe are as bad or worse in Australia. It's just that I don't need to have, I don't have them at my hands. One cause of concern for savers who are concerned about the maintenance of purchasing power in whatever fiat currency they choose to hold it in Australian dollars or US dollars, might be concerned about what uh, the big thinkers now call quantitative easing. Carrie, if you were quantitative easing, quantitatively easing, if you were printing Stevenson's and trying to buy them, that would be called counterfeiting and you would be thrown in prison. If, however, you were a member of parliament, it would be highly popular with your constituents and it would get you elected, irrespective of the popularity of quantitative easing. What it really is, is counterfeiting. Making more uh, of a specious currency unit with nothing to back it up does not increase the value of the existing specious currency units in circulation. Of more concern, of course, uh, are government debt and deficits. Uh, I'll leave private debts to your own imagination. But in my country, I can't speak for Australia, but in the United States, the on balance sheet liabilities of the federal government exceed $33 trillion. Now, the balance sheet of the federal government is, of course, $7 trillion. Uh, the proceeds largely of the aforementioned counterfeiting. That's how much money they've printed and given to themselves. But the net debt, the debt net of counterfeiting uh, in the US uh, now uh, exceeds $26 trillion. Let's use the more conservative number. But that isn't the real number. The net present value of liabilities of the U.S. federal government for entitlements, Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, things like that, looking after old folks like me, exceeds, by the estimate of our Congressional Budget Office, $120 trillion. That's 12 zeros for you who have tough times imagining it on the bad side of the decimal point. And we propose to, sur to service this aggregate federal liability, which now exceeds $140 trillion, with a budget 
that is itself generating an annual deficit of $2 trillion a year. In a household, of course, <laughs> this would be unsustainable. And over time in a society, it is unsustainable too. It, the aggregate size of the debt not only leads to concern about the crowding out of par private borrowers in the credit space, but it also makes you wonder ultimately about the credit quality of the issuer of the debt. There is no doubt that they can print our way out of this, but that requires, of course, the way they chose to deal with the debt and the deficits in the 1970s, which is to say you reduce the net present value of the obligation by inflation. But let's move on. Another worry, and I suspect the thing that has American savers at least the most worried, is negative real interest rates. It is true that recently the purported inflation rate, the CPI, has declined. But I would suggest to the delegates at the conference that the CPI is itself another fraudulent government construct. In the first instance, the CPI is hedonistically adjusted, which is to say, if the big thinkers think that a stereo now has better physical properties than a stereo 20 years ago and you pay more for it, that's a hedonistic adjustment. It doesn't actually cost you more. Uh, they also, when it suits them, ignore what they call food and, uh, uh, pardon me, uh, food and fuel to come with a core inflation number. Anyone who knows me well knows I like to eat. You can tell by looking. And so a cost of living number that doesn't include food or fuel is really a very little use to me. The thing that bothers me the most about the index though, Kerry, is that the CPI doesn't include the cost of government. It doesn't include tax as an example or fees, which are for most Australians and most Americans, the largest component of their household expense, greater in fact than shelter, transportation, food, and energy combined. A cost of living index that doesn't take into account the cost of government has got to be the silliest construct in the history of humankind. Carrie, as I've told you before, if I didn't have to pay the tax, I wouldn't bitch quite so much about the index, but that isn't on offer. So those people who are considering an investment in gold or gold related securities or those people who are concerned about the precious metals market need ask themselves a question. Are they concerned about quantitative easing? Are they concerned about debt and deficits? And are they concerned about interest rates? Because traditionally this fear of the maintenance of purchasing power in fiat denominated instruments are the largest cases of gold bull markets. I'll throw out one more thing uh, before I move on to other parts of the gold market. I'll throw out the fact that precious metals and precious metals related securities among the length and breadth of human humanity are very, very under owned. In my own country, the ascribed market share of precious metals and precious metals related investments relative to all other classes of savings and investment products is less than one half of 1%, which is to say that less than one half of 1% of all American savings and investment assets are precious metals related. JP Morgan Chase estimates that the four decade mean market share of precious metals in the US savings and investment market is 2%. And I would suggest to the delegates of this fine conference that if savers and voters and investors in the United States consider quantitative easing, debt and deficits, and negative real interest rates, and they think of them as a possibility even rather than a probability, that the market share of precious metals and precious metals related assets in the United States, which by the way accounts for 23% uh, of the world's savings and investment assets migrates from its current one half of 1% to the four decade mean of 2%. Were that to happen, and by the way, I think it's likely, demand for precious metals and precious metals related assets 
would increase fourfold. And that's precisely what I personally believe is going to happen. Why hasn't it happened already? Well, I would ascribe it to recency balance, region, uh, recency balance, uh, <laughs> recency preference. It, most people in the world regard themselves uh, as sort of um, unbiased fact checkers. We believe that what we do is we import data and information from all sorts of sources, and we process that data rationally in our minds, uh, and, and we draw rational conclusions. Except that's not what we do. I've been working with investors for 45 years, uh, one of whom, named Rick Rule, I know extremely well. And that isn't the process by which most people operate. Most people look through the world for information that supports their existing paradigms and preferences. And one of our preferences is not to be afraid. Another preference is to rely on other people, the government perhaps, to look after our financial future, to obviate, in fact, responsibility for ourselves going forward. Further, this recency bias that I described means that the lessons that we've learned over the last 40 years, that interest rates will go lower, that dominant currencies will remain dominant, that the economic bonus that we've got from the demographics of the last 40 years and that one can buy the dip have caused us not to be concerned or as concerned about the arithmetic around quantitative easing, debt and deficits, and negative real interest rates. I remember just such a period myself when I was coming into the investment business in the 1970s. In the 1970s, we were coming off the, the 50s and the 60s, which were also very buoyant economic times, particularly, of course, in the United States. The fact that the United States government had sought to win two wars simultaneously, the war in Vietnam and the war in, on poverty, both of which they lost, by the way, left us with a legacy in the United States uh, of very high government debt uh, and, and very high deficits. Uh, and the circumstance that we faced then was similar to the, the one that we face today. And the recipe uh, for success and the recipe for failure were equally transparent, but the understanding of the circumstance that we faced in the decade of the 70s didn't begin to manifest itself in the actions of the American people, I would suggest until 1974, four or five years after they had become apparent. I'm not one of those who believes that the US dollar hegemony uh, is going to end. I'm not one of those who believes that the gold is going to win the war against fiat currencies, the US dollar in particular. I am one who believes that the US, that uh, gold, pardon me, and precious metals by extension is going to lose the war less badly. As I had suggested to you before, uh, my, con my uh, assumptions are fairly modest, which is to say that the market share of the stuff goes from half a percent to two percent. Uh, hardly an unusual outcome, given the magnitude of the problem. And by the way, the problem I described with regards to the federal debt in the United States doesn't include <laughs> state and local debts, uh, nor does it include underfunded private pensions, nor does it include individual or corporate debt, all of which are at very high levels relative to GDP on a historical basis. I'm, as an example, very glad about the circumstance that there has been uh, a lagging expectation with regards to precious metals in the future. I consistently buy precious metals for my own account, and I am delighted that I have to use less money rather than more money to purchase those. I'm one of those who hopes actually that I'm wrong. I hope that the price of gold doesn't go up. Because if the price of gold doesn't go up, it means the set of circumstances that I so fear doesn't transpire. Because you see, I regard physical gold as insurance more than anything else. But the asset class that interests me most isn't an insurance class, it's the gold stocks. Because I believe, based on work that I and many people that I respect uh, have done, uh, is that the price of uh, high quality and medium quality gold equities is the lowest relative to their net present value that it has ever been in my career. Now, I need to break this down. If you construct 
net present values based on cash flows from reserves and resources uh, at current gold prices or at the gold strip. The net present value of gold equities is, in my opinion, relative to their enterprise values, the lowest that it has been in my career. I believe that if you believe that the gold price is going to go up for the reasons that I have uh, suggested, that if you are willing to take operational risk, uh, if you are willing to study, to do the work, to be an investor uh, rather than an insurance buyer by way of buying bullion, that this is a wonderful time because the uh, companies themselves suffer from very low investor expectation, which is to say the premium that they enjoyed for many years relative to the gold price has evaporated and in fact gone negative. You can, uh, as investors, approach this two different ways. One is to buy what I would call the beta, which is to say the potential outperformance of the gold equities relative to other equities. Doing this, you buy the highest quality gold companies that you can buy and hang on, sometimes for dear life. It has been my experience that in precious metals bull markets, either big ones or little ones, that the sector itself enjoys two or three or 400% capital gains over time. And there's a wonderful argument to be made for either buying a very broad-based gold equity ETF, or I would suggest, rather than buying the ETFs, buying the five or six best gold companies that you can find. Not owning the, 50, the 40 companies in the ETF, but rather the five or six best of them. Giving you the beta that you want in the market, but de-risking the, the, uh, the trade uh, by not owning the marginal companies which often populate the ETF. The other alternative, which I suspect most of you will attempt to employ because you're at a gold conference, uh, is generating alpha, which is to say buying companies that will outperform the gold market. And I think the opportunities to do that are particularly attractive if you are doing to willing to do the work. One of the things I've done for the last six years is I have graded investors' portfolios on a no-obligation basis. In six years, I've graded 80,000 natural resource portfolios from investors around the world. And one of the things that I've learned is that most people own many more stocks than they could possibly, possibly follow. I ask people who own speculative stocks to own a number of speculative stocks that corresponds to the number of hours per month that they spend studying the companies in their portfolios. And by that, I don't mean watching gold videos on YouTube. I mean reading annual reports, proxy statements, uh, quarterly reports, income statements, cash flow statements, that kind of thing. Uh, the truth is, with regards to seeking alpha, less is better. Concentrate more, number, more money on higher quality issues that you follow and follow extremely well. Understand, too, that there's an important difference between volatility and risk. If you have prepared yourself, if you have an idea in your mind as to what a company is worth, you can make volatility work for you as opposed to against you. You know and I know that the Australian juniors and the Canadian juniors can vary in price by 20% the way that you and I inhale and exhale. If you don't have the courage of your convictions, this volatility is scary. If you do have the courage of your convictions, volatility represents occasional sales. And sales are good. So I'd like to leave you with this before I address you individually. Uh, that is that I think and sometimes fear that the gold price is going higher. And when I say higher, I don't mean a little higher. I know I mean much higher. I remember myself uh, in 2000 when people had basically given up on gold that the gold price ran in US dollar terms from $250 to, if my memory serves me well, $1,850. I'm not looking for a move in gold from $1,935 or whatever it is to $2,100. And I don't care at all about the price of gold a fortnight from now. I do believe over the course of five years that the market share of gold will go from half a percent to 2%, which is to say that the gold price won't go higher. It will go much higher. If I'm correct, if I'm correct, the benefit that you will get from beta, which is to say the outperformance of the gold equities relative to other equities, 
will be handsome indeed and perhaps shelter you from the loss which you may incur in other parts of your portfolio, particularly your long bond portfolio, which I'm very afraid of for, for you on. For those of you who are willing to do the work, and Australians ought to be, ought to be willing to do the work, uh, given the number of great companies in your junior sector, seeking alpha uh, in the gold shares, again, if you are willing to do the work, I think over the next five to 10 years will be unusually rewarding if you do the work and if you can stomach volatility. Harry, thank you so much for the opportunity to, to address your audience. And assuming I have any time left, I'd be happy to entertain individual questions. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please thank Rick Raw for his time. Terry, I'm afraid you're cutting in now. I can't hear anything. Uh, Rick, we do have a lot of people that want to ask questions. Um, and so, as you just said, I can, um, I can take a couple of questions. Can we, I have somebody with a microphone down here? I haven't got this organized very well. Rick, but that's all right. Um, we got a mic? Yep, just bring it to me. I'll, I'll get off the stage and I'll take the microphone around. All right. Losing valuable moments. All right, the first question is from Miss Elizabeth. Rick, go ahead. Good morning, Rick. I have a question in three parts. Three key items as a new investor I need to know. The second one is, how long should I hold stocks for? And if I hold for five years, do I want an early stage explorer or a maiden resource? <laughs> and the third one is, Battle Bank, when do you envisage um, being available to Australian public? Battle Bank. Last question, straight away. Um, uh, Battle Bank will be open when the FDIC allows us to open it, uh, which we are hoping occurs in October. Initially, uh, we will do business with Americans and Canadians. Uh, our last bank, Everbank, was able to, uh, to uh, extend the franchise, as it were, uh, to Australians in about a year. Uh, we, that depends uh, partly on my government and partly on your government. Uh, if I sound pessimistic, I'm not, but it'll be a process. Your second question involved holding periods. Uh, Warren Buffett famously said that the market is a wonderful mechanism for transferring money from impatient people to patient people. And in fact said that the ideal holding period is forever. I don't think that's true. I think you begin to sell your gold stocks when you believe that quantitative easing is over when you're less concerned about debt and deficits, and in particular when uh, interest rates, nominal interest rates, go real. You might too look at a circumstance where the uh, market share of precious metals and precious metals related assets exceeded the 40 year norms, which is to say exceeded 2%. Now ironically, if that occurs, uh, Gold will be so popular, gold will appear uh, favorably as opposed to unfavorably in the pages of Australian newspapers and in Australian media, which is to say that you'll be psychologically unprepared to sell because all of the signs will point to higher gold. It's precisely when your recency bias turns from negative to positive that you need to begin the process of liquidating and transferring to other assets that are unpopular. Uh, as to big companies or small companies, generally longer term holders are better off with beta than alpha. Uh, it, that also is a function of how hard you're willing to work. You don't have to do much work to own the five or six best gold companies in the world. If you believe, uh, as I believe, in the eventual ascendance of gold with regards to market share. And I'm sorry, I didn't hear the first question that you asked. No, I didn't quite hear it either. I will just read it out for you because she doesn't have the microphone. Uh, okay, she'd like to know so the three key items as a new investor she should be know about, be aware of. Three key things. I think in order of importance, uh, perhaps the past track record of management 
and, and how their curriculum vitae correspond to the task at hand. In other words, are the people running the company very, very good people, serially successful people? A and people who have been successful at or approximately at the same task that they have been assigned uh, in, in this circumstance. Good people do well, average people do average, bad people do bad, that's the way it works. The second is the juxtaposition between net asset value and enterprise value. This is a bit trickier. Uh, you can't go necessarily by book value, but companies are required in their annual reports to issue uh, estimates of the net present value of their reserves and resources. And while these are never accurate, they're always more accurate than no information whatsoever. A simple juxtaposition between the net present value estimate in the annual report and the sum of the company's market capitalization and net debt is sufficient to understand uh, as much as is easy to, easy to understand the juxtaposition between price and value. Understanding the balance sheet too is important to understand if there are existential uh, risks published, uh, pardon me, uh, that could threaten the company in terms of operational insolvency or uh, excessive debt. But one of the things that you must do as an investor in resources that you don't have to do as much in other businesses is to pay attention to the project pipeline. Uh, it, it's interesting, but companies that are able to pay dividends, high dividends, are often able to pay those high dividends because they don't have competing uses of capital. And then in 10 years or 12 years, when the mine runs out, they have no more capital to distribute. So it's important to look at the project pipeline after you've looked at the net present value and after you've looked at management and figure out whether the company is itself sustainable uh, and if they have sufficient reinvestment options uh, with regards to their current cash flow that will enable them to enjoy cash flows in the future. Um, I, I've one very quick question. We're running out of time, Rick. I've got about a minute left. One very quick question, sir. Okay, Rick. Um, thanks for your presentation. Look, very quickly, I've seen numerous YouTube videos of you and other um, precious metal speakers, and there's people in the precious metals industry which believe that the price of metals is being very significantly manipulated. So mm -hmm. can you um, say yes or no, you think that's happening, and if gold goes up a lot, Will it not be smashed down by the futures contracts? I believe that governments occasionally intervene in the price of gold. I do not believe that there is an ongoing, thoroughgoing manipulation uh, to depress the price of gold. I think a rising US dollar has done a wonderful job of that for 40 years. I also believe that's over. It is very clear that all financial markets are manipulated. The LIBOR market, the US Treasury market, the S&P 500, all of these have been proven to be manipulated in the very short term. And I remember in the decade of the 1970s where trading desks manipulated the price of gold up because that was the easiest way to manipulate it. Any financial market that has uh, an enormous uh, volume imbalance between the futures paper market and the current physical market is very prone to short-term manipulation. And gold and silver are in fact prone. But I do not believe that the malaise in the gold price or the silver price has anything to do with some vast international conspiracy of the Bilderbergs and the Federal Reserve. I think it has to do with desks taking advantage of market circumstances to their advantage and your disadvantage. Rick Rawl, thank you so much for your time. And by the way, the next presentation, I'm just so you know, because I know you like large uh, gold projects, is to grey mining. The ASX code for you, Mr. Rick Rawl, is DEG, but they've got a big project over in Pilbara. They're up right after, uh, after we uh, finish up with you. But I would just like to say my personal thanks for your time today. And I know our audience will show their appreciation as well. And I look forward to uh, seeing you in person very soon. But again, thank you so much for your time for now. Thanks, Rick.